Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. My name is Carl Peets, and I'm Research Director of the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transports, also known as SLOCAT. And on behalf of the SLOCAT Partnership, I'd like to welcome you to this second webinar in a series on the Transport and Climate Change Global Status Report, also known as the TCC GSR. And I would like to begin by acknowledging in particular, the primary supporters of the project who are listed in the bottom right of this opening slide. These include BMU, the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety, GIZ, the German Corporation for International Cooperation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. And I will take the opportunity to acknowledge the many other contributors to the report just a bit later in this presentation. And as we jump in, I will note that this second webinar is focused on policy landscapes, which in, in which we will describe and give some examples on how various cities, countries, and companies are setting targets, and um, I should say ambitious targets on low carbon transport and demonstrating success in implementation in a number of country contexts. And the next slide, please. As mentioned, this is the second in a series on the TCC GSR. The first of these webinars was held exactly one month ago on the 30th of April. And for those of you who are not able to join us for that initial webinar, we would welcome you to have a look at the, at the recording of the webinar, which can be viewed on, as noted here on, on Silkat's YouTube channel at the following link. And as we move into today's webinar, uh, just, just a brief overview to, to set the stage and set the agenda. Following these uh, initial remarks that I will offer to, to put the re report in some broader context, we will then welcome Megumi Endo, Program Officer of the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And Megumi will offer some background on transports, contributions, uh, potential contributions to the Paris Agreement and uh, the various mechanisms for, for incorporating those. We will then turn to Bronwyn Thornton. She's Chief Executive Officer of Walk 21. And Bronwyn will describe the important contribution of walking and cycling in taking a balanced approach to climate change mitigation within the transport sector. Then we will look to Sheila Watson, Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation, who will give us some background on the important role of fuel economy in, in reducing emissions in the transport sector using cost-effective um, existing technologies. And next we will look to Hannah Murdoch, Project Manager and Analyst from REN21, and she will describe the, again, the important contribution of renewable energy in helping us reach a truly net zero emissions transport sector. We will follow the panel with, uh, of course, questions from the other participants on this call. So we look forward to your questions and we would invite you at any point during this presentation or during this webinar to submit your questions through the chat function on GoToMeeting. And um, please feel free to indicate to whom you would like your question directed. So in, um, in starting, I'd like to give just a little bit more background on the SLOCAT partnership. Uh, again, for those of you who may not be familiar, SLOCAT is a multi-stakeholder partnership of more than 90 organizations who are united in efforts to raise the profile of sustainable transport in, in global agreements on climate change and sustainable development and really to support implementation and accelerate implementation to um, meet the ambitious goals under the equally ambitious timeframes. And I'd like to note that the TCC GSR is a recent addition to um, a, a number of SLOCAT knowledge products, which are, which are all intended to support policymakers and practitioners in raising ambition and again, accelerating progress toward implementation. 
So with that, I would like to thank the general supporters who are listed at the bottom of the slide here, general supporters of SLOCAT who are making not only the, the TCC GSR possible, but a number of complementary products uh, possible as well. Turning to the report itself, this is, uh, again, it's, it's, it's very much a joint project of the SLOCAT partnership, SLOCAT members and other strategic contributors. The report was launched in December 2018 at COP24 in Katowice, Poland. And, and the report has three primary objectives. Um, really to reiterate, it is, a, it is meant to provide an important resource for, for both policymakers, as I said, and practitioners, both at national and subnational levels to help increase ambition within uh, the transport and climate change sphere, both for mitigation and adaptation. It's also intended to strengthen linkages between climate change and sustainable development benefits of low carbon transport measures. And finally, it is intended to establish a broader platform for participation of a wider set of stakeholders, um, again, including the participants on this call. So we're very fortunate to have you all today um, joining this conversation. And as noted here on the slide, it's, it's a broad global assessment has um, nearly 200 policy examples from over 70 countries. We're tracking over 60 indicators in eight policy areas to be described um, by a few of our panelists. And we have a, a, a rich set of figures, more than 60 figures with historical data dating to 1970, as well as projected data out to 2050. And um, a, a very important slide in the deck, as noted, is to, um, to, to describe and acknowledge a bit more the contributors, the many contributors to the TCC GSR. As noted, very much uh, a, a very broad effort. In addition to the primary supporters at the top of the slide, as described in, in our opening slide, I'd like to acknowledge those organizations contributing to the, the strategy team, the initial scoping and structuring of the report represented by the logos here, um, and certainly more individuals than can, can be quickly captured in this slide. And at the bottom of the slide, um, really, really foremost are those contributors to the, the content of the report itself, more than 20 authors and, and 40 other contributors to the report's sections and content, and over 50 peer reviewers from 30 plus organizations who have helped to add to the details and, and keep this report um, to a very high level. So we'd like to express our appreciation to these contributors um, for all aspects of the report. I'd like to give a very brief overview of the structure of the GSR just to put today's webinar into context. As you can see here in the column to the left, the report is divided into four different parts. The first two of these parts were touched upon in last uh, month's webinar, which include a global overview looking at uh, trends at regional levels for passenger and freight transport, for international aviation and shipping under part one, and in part two, in which we've described broadly trends in transport demand, transport emissions, and potential mitigation pathways. And in today's webinar, we'll focus on part three, as highlighted here, transport and climate change policy measures. This is broken further into two sections, the first describing frameworks for tracking low carbon transport measures, which will be addressed in part by our first panelist. And to the right of the slide, we are focused, uh, the report focuses on eight specific policy areas within uh, the transport and low, uh, excuse me, transport and climate change sphere. And we will welcome uh, our remaining panelists to, to touch on three of those um, specific policy areas, which I will describe further in the following slide. And so to put um, our report in a broader framework, as many of you are familiar, we are, we are organizing it in part through the, the avoid, shift, and improve framework, which is a, a holistic and comprehensive approach to capturing various sustainable transport measures, which describe uh, three different approaches. First, the, the, the need to avoid and reduce the the need for motorized travel to reduce the number and length of these trips, the need to shift to more environmentally friendly modes and, and lower carbon modes 
in making those trips, both for passengers and goods. And finally, to improve the energy efficiency and environmental performance of transport modes where they can be easily shifted. And so as noted here, the th three highlighted policy areas at the bottom of this slide will be uh, among the eight covered in the report. These will be featured within this presentation by the forthcoming panelists. So with that, I would like to turn to the first of our four panelists today. Once again, this is Megumi Endo. She is Program Officer of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And Megumi again will describe some of the UN frameworks for, for tracking and structuring movement toward um, meeting these Paris Agreement goals. So Megumi, please um, take it away. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so today I mentioned very briefly the um, what the, the structure of the Paris Agreement uh, or architecture of the agreement, uh, where and then where you can contribute to the the Paris goal. Um, the first next slide, please. Um, we would like to, I would like to first touch upon um, why the Paris Agreement was possible and. Unlike Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement is a bottom-up approach. It gives um, authorities to each of the countries, parties to the uh, convention, to define how much contribution that they can make towards the goal that they agreed. Um, so we we feel that um, multilateralism is something that we need to, that needs to be reinforced since climate change is a global issue and no single country could do uh, to tackle, but the multilateralism of UNFCCC or United Nations um, Intergovernmental Process was the forum where all countries got to come together and acknowledge their differences, but also the common goal to, to fight against this global challenge. So it was um, the very, fundamental uh, principle of the agreement, which has now, I move on to this particular slide, um, has six key elements. And they are um, temperature goal, pre-2020 action and support, transparency and global stock take, finance technology and capacity building, mitigation and voluntary cooperation, adaptation and loss and damage. So basically, the Paris Agreement sets temperature goal of two, limiting the, the global rise, uh, temperature rise to two degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees. Um, and then for that to, to mitigate, we have cooperation, international cooperation, but also um, adaptation and resilience um, action is increasingly important because there is already climate change that's happening, even if we have all the mitigation efforts in place, um, we need to also adapt and uh, make the infrastructure resilient. And for that, we have also what's called means of implementation, which are finance, technology, and capacity building. Um, and what's underpinning in the uh, Paris Agreement is what is called national determined contribution, which is, well, as I mentioned, um, the the bottom-up approach uh, efforts of individual countries that determines their own climate, national climate plan. And the idea is to, to ratchet up the ambition over time um, through the global stock take cycle, what we call ambition cycle. And in order to um, examine collective efforts, whether the collective efforts of all the countries are in compliance, compliance with the temperature goal and an adaptation goal, um, we needed to have concrete um, requirements on the transparency of efforts. So that's the um, icon on transparency and global stock take. And since when we, when we were drafting the Paris Agreement, um, when the, the parties were drafting the Paris Agreement, um, we were thinking perhaps that would come into place in a couple of years later, in 2020 or so, then in order not to Stop the momentum of climate action. Um, we also set out the um, framework of pre-2020 action and support, and that's also something that what we call Marrakesh Partnership um, is working on with the efforts and, and contribution of all of you in transport sector. Um, next slide, please. So. 
just uh, quickly on this global stock take cycle or ambition cycle, as we say, um, we had so all the countries um, who ratified the Paris Agreement have already national determined contribution or the national economic plan submitted. And that um, that was since that was uh, made in the early stage, we they, they were also invited and encouraged to update and revise those national climate plans by 2020, and that's next year. And we are um, this this year is a very important year for all of us to kind of enhance ambition and enhance dialogue with policymakers. And you in the transport sector. Um, uh, in a very good position to offer your expertise and knowledge um, to policymakers so that they can you can build confidence of government to enhance their ambition. So the if you look at this uh, red year of NDC 2020, 2025, so next year 2020 is one uh, milestone point where um, governments are updating or revising and that collective efforts will be examined in what's called global stock take in 2023. And this stock take cycle begins um, in 2023 for every five years. And then you can see this cycle of, and then again, revision and update by 2025, which will be collectively examined in 2028, and on, on and on, so and so. So this was the um, Paris Agreement um, global, global Stock architecture that is embedded in the agreement. And we are hoping that through this cycle, um, your contributions um, to the national um, policymakers would be reflected in their ambitious um, NDCs. And collectively, um, NDCs would be able to meet the, the Paris goals of um, temperature and adaptation. Next slide, please. And here we would like to quickly run through what happened post Paris Agreement period. And so 2015, we had Paris Agreement adoption. Um, and with uh, lots of global um, support and um, also with from non-party stakeholders' contribution, we had this Paris Agreement already entering into force the following year. And since the Paris Agreement was more um, an, called visionary uh, agreement and it did not have concrete rule book or operationalization details yet, parties continued to discuss the um, work program of Paris Agreement in 2016, 2017, and 2018, that's the following three years. And in the meantime, we had IPCC report 1.5 report um, that I'm sure you have all heard, um, uh, urging the, the uh, climate action in at a higher speed, and um, also what's called Taranoa dialogue. This was um, it, this is basically the year-long dialogue process where parties and non-party stakeholders gathered together, sharing knowledge and experiences to overcome um, climate action challenges or barriers um, for higher ambition. And this created a um, very significant space of dialogue between non-party stakeholders and parties which hadn't existed systematically. Some countries had voluntary uh, initiatives of um, town hall meetings or informal meetings with experts, but um, this Taranoa dialogue was a very methodical approach where our presidency encouraged all parties to hold and they also conducted at sessions of UNFCCC conferences and there were many positive feedback from countries saying we never thought this would work but actually all the problems we had by sharing these stories and um, issues with non-party stakeholders there are many people who came, for, who came forward um, offering the solution. So this created a, a positive atmosphere of solving the issues in a more integrated approach, um, not just Ministry of Environment, but different um, ministries in the government, not just at federal level, but subnational and cities, as Carl mentioned earlier, um, and not just transport sector, but different 
cross-cutting issues of with the water, oceans, um, and with energy sector and cities coalitions, it really created a partnership horizontally and vertically. And so that was a very um, important step. And you can also capitalize on this uh, effort um, going, going forward so that this conversation and dialogue of um, national policymakers and non-party stakeholders will be a norm going forward. Um, and then in COP24, at the end of uh, last year, we had a um, climate passage, which is basically the rule book of the Paris Agreement. A few issues were unsolved, which would continue discussion um, this year, but that's the um, development of the last three years so far. Next slide, slide please. So the outlook for this year, given that implementation is happening in the, at the local level, um, we are shifting convening activities to the regional level. Um, so what we call regional climate week, we have three annually, uh, one in Africa, one in Latin America and the Caribbean, and in the um, Asia Pacific. This year we had already one in Africa, and two remaining ones are, as you see, dates and the country. Um, this is where Marrakesh Partnership Partner uh, stakeholders um, are very much uh, playing a key role um, in terms of curating the conversations with policymakers. Secretariat facilitates um, this space for transport sector colleagues. Um, and then the beauty of this regional climate weeks is that we do not have negotiation meetings going on in parallel. So parties or policymakers are more focused on the discussion at hand and uh, listen to the non-party stakeholders more you know, undivided attention. And in partnership with other agencies like UNDP and World Bank, we are also um, organizing NDC dialogue where policymakers in each of the country in the region are invited and discuss concrete issues in terms of um, enhancement and implementation of NDCs. And Marrakesh Partnership, um, the Secretariat through the Marrakesh Partnership um, is also contributing to this interface and matchmaking um, in this conversation forum. So this is, these are very important uh, platforms for us going forward. And this year in particular, UN Secretary General um, is organizing the summit on 23rd of September, and transport sector is one of the nine uh, tracks um, called Infrastructure Cities and Local Action Track. Um, this is something also very ambitious. It is not going to be a regular summit where heads of state will come and go and make statement, but um, the summit team is trying to set um, very high criteria for concrete climate action that, are, that is transformative and inducing systemic changes. Um, so I'm sure many of you are quite fully um, involved in this and we are aware of this uh, event. And that pur the purpose of this summit is to infuse political impetus and, and momentum to raise ambition in time for 2020. So we are hoping that, that this momentum would come, continue on through COP25 and in 2020 in the form of more ambitious updates and revision of um, NDCs. And at COP25, I understand um, that there was a very good conversation between transport sector colleagues and the Chilean presidency, and there's an idea to bring transport ministers to the um, um, to the COP, which is normally the um, conference of ministries of environment. So this is, I think, um, a very uh, new innovative breakthrough um, in the time where we need integrated approach for implementation, where ministries of energy, transport, um, health, land, working together with the environment ministries. So this is a very positive um, development that the Secretariat is very much supported of. Um, and then we have Marrakesh Partnership Action Event. 
in or on transport, in addition to a few roundtables. Um, but these uh, events in general are just the milestones, and there are a lot of work going on in between these events or milestones. Um, and we are in, we are in Marrakech partnership um, promoting very much this integrated approach with subnational governments, cities, different sectors, um, including the transport sector, and particularly in transport sector, um, Chilean champion, the Chilean uh, presidency, um, uh, has that intense focus on resilience adaptation as one of the um, priorities of the COP. So in, for transport sector, we are also hoping that resilience and adaptation aspect uh, of the work would also have more visibility um, and traction. Thank you very much. So this is a quick run through of the process. Thank you very much, Megumi, for um, giving us a, a very broad overview of um, of these processes, and I think it's it's uh, again reiterating some of your earlier and your final points. Really, um, certainly very important to to look at all of our climate action efforts in a in a cross cutting lens through a cross cutting lens, taking an integrated approach. Very helpful to um, see these efforts to link national and subnational actors, and to as you said, to build confidence in governments um, to help increase their ambition. So, um, thank you very much for that. Just want to note that for um, with the, the TCC GSR, we are making a similar effort to, to, um, to bring together sectors and to incorporate actors at many levels. So um, very nice to be working in, in tandem with UNFCCC. And with, with, with that in mind, I would like to um, turn to the first of our policy areas to be discussed in depth today. This is walking and cycling, and I will invite Bronwyn Thornton, once again, she is Chief Executive Officer of Walk 21. And Bronwyn, we look forward to hearing your comments on why walking and cycling is a very essential element in moving us toward uh, a, a proportional contribution from the transport sector to achieving the Paris Agreement targets. So um, please uh, take it away, Bronwyn. Right, great. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate today. And I must say thank you for choosing walking and cycling as your first policy area for discussion in this series of webinars, um, as because its place in the system, of course, is walking is our first mode of movement, of transport, of, of being human. And so it's great to have that priority. I will um, provide a short overview of the chapter within the report um, using the, these lovely graphics to give you a sense of the, the state um, of walking and walking policy um, and some of the pressures and, and issues associated with that. I am presenting for cycling as well with the blessing of my um, cycling colleagues and um, but I'm afraid my inclination will be to uh, have a bent more on the walking but certainly there is lots of good information uh, in more depth about walking, uh, about cycling in the chapter. So as you can see here, um, despite the sort of neglect of walking um, in our cities and in our transport systems, um, actually one third of all our trips are made on foot or by bicycle. This is a global sort of wrap up. It's very difficult to do this global wrap up and to present uh, walking uh, percentages that are in to have any confidence in their comparability because of the variations not only in how they're measured but what is measured what's determined as a walking journey and um, how so therefore how far is a walking journey and also what uh, trip purpose is used to measure this and anybody who works in in measuring mode share will know that historically it's journey to work, which loses a vast amount of people who walk, um, or and historically it's got to be journeys over a certain distance, which again loses a lot of those connected journeys, particularly to public transport. But as you can see here in this slide, um, mode share of walking does vary extraordinarily, 
um, and from Brisbane at uh, in Ottawa in Canada in, uh, in Australia um, with very low shares um, right through to Nairobi with 61%. Um, Zurich is the star within a European context with 33% and that's not um, by accident, that is by design and that's what's very interesting in, the, in, in thinking um, about this. But what is very clear uh, that generally speaking walking is higher in cities with public transport networks, for example Hong Kong, um, and low income cities. Next slide, please. So looking at the transport activity, as you can see in low income countries, the mean daily minutes of walking or cycling for transport is about 60 minutes. And the percentage of the population doing this work, uh, doing these activities is about 83% in these low income countries. I want to make two quick observations about the fact that we have to talk about walking and cycling together here and we clarify this in the chapter that generally um, particularly in African countries when you get any of these statistics where walking and cycling is measured nearly every time 95% of this activity will be walking not cycling whereas in other countries perhaps more in some of the Asian countries there will be more cycling than walking. So we have to be very careful with these sorts of conglomerations. But what's interesting here is this is within a transport activity sector. And when you look at it from a World Health perspective, um, this is the sort of levels of walking or active travel that we want on daily basis for our populations. So it's always problematic when we talk about walking because going back to Carl's model about avoid, shift and improve, we put walking rightly into the shift mode, as in we want people to be using this, this mode for their travel. But actually that's a very global north concept because essentially in the global south, we want to retain people to walk. We don't want to shift them into walking, we want to keep them walking. But they're not going to stay walking because the environments in which they're asked to walk um, are very, very poor. Next slide, please. And in fact, this is the, um, research from Asia shows that given a chance people will shift to other modes as soon as they can afford it and uh, this is a study done um, in Asian cities um, but I imagine that it applies across African and Latin American um, communities as well that basically if you don't make it nicer to walk um, then we're going to go and do something else and this would have, as we know and as we um, understand from a climate as well as a city management perspective, a catastrophic, uh, it's a big word but it's true, a catastrophic impact on how we manage our cities. And we will lose the health benefits that um, this mode, mode will share and we will gain all of the disbenefits um, of, in, of uh of the motorized modes if we had this level of shift. Now I know Sheila is going to talk about improving these other modes and that's an essential part of it, but in the balance of modal share and space management, we still need to retain our pedestrian movement to underpin our public transport services and to ensure the quality of life um, in our cities. Next slide, please. Because as you can see by this lovely slide um, with some, some material, and this is where Switzerland, this is Swiss francs, is the measure in um, these diagrams. And what they discovered in Switzerland is that they actually realize more benefits than it costs them to um, have people walking. For every kilometer walked, they're saving 10 cents. Um, in, in, uh, in their investment. So this is a win-win environment. You are winning in terms of underpinning your public transport, reductions in air and noise pollution, reductions in congestion, um, improvements in public health, equity and inclusion. Walking is so, and cycling are so broad ranging and across all of these dimensions of city management and city impact. But when we come to try and put walking into the transport mix and into this climate sector mix, it gets a bit tricky because walking is a zero carbon mode and so how we value walking in the system it can't be valued for decarbonization which is what a lot of other measures of success are based on and so we have to be talking about um, how we value walking correctly and how we uh, measure it 
um, accurately. Uh, next slide, please. This slide um, is a great example. It just illustrates perfectly um, what that what we are trading off between our different modes here. The capacity for moving people in the space available um, versus the carbon impact. And as you can see, private motorized travel loses big time in these sorts of graphs, but we are still seeing this as being where cities are investing um, in their transport sectors, as well as some of these other modes. So we are looking a lot at how do we build in the value of walking into some of these other projects so that we can improve these outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where you come to what are the inputs we need for the system to generate improved outputs. And in this indicators table, um, I use a lot of language around input indicators and output indicators. In this context, we talk about what are the inputs or the policy landscape indicators and what are the market development um, indicators. Now, we debated a lot whether to include this table in the, in the report because, as you can see, there's no information. But that's why it's included. That's why it's important. Because albeit two or three countries have national walking plans um, and some have national cycling plans, um, they're not com they're uh, not consistent and they're not comparable um, globally in terms of saying this is how we measure this indicator and that becomes even more so in the set of data below the blue line which is until we can get some consistent comparable methodologies to ensure that the data we're putting in here is um, valid reliable and properly represents these modes within our transport systems, um, we haven't yet been able to include them. Next slide, please, because this is the slide of good news. It's a lovely, um, it's important to know that things are changing though, that there's a lot of work going on, there's a lot of commitment from cities around cycling and walking, recognition of the benefits, the value to uh, the transport sector in noise and air pollution and congestion reduction, and you see some lovely examples of policies. And sometimes in cities where people don't expect that they would need to do something. Paris, for example, you would very rarely get someone think that Paris wasn't a nice city to walk in, but they are making comprehensive investment um, in being a better walkable city, all motivated by the uh, climate agenda, as well as public space agendas. And in the UK, they're investing, it says here 1.4 billion in walking and cycling. Um, with the aim to double the share of cycling by 2025. That's actually 1.3 billion in cycling and about 0.1 billion in, um, in walking. So you can see how when you group these things together, you lose the reality of those different modes, but it's also um, a fantastic investment uh, within the UK um, through interlocal authorities over time. Bogota are also ambitious around cycling trips and Mexico City um, realizing the economic gains and the social cohesion reduction in crime gains gains that can come from pedestrianization and increase in uh, in walking trips. And so to finish with the the picture from uh, Seoul in South Korea, where Mayor Park transformed this um, vehicle overpass into a pedestrian linear park and it was launched in 2017 but this is not just a recreational facility or it's not going to remain a recreational facility um, because the ambition now is to connect it into the main uh, train station which is literally just across the road and have it as a viable transport facility as well and so to close um, I want to share with you a last slide and uh, issue an invitation to join us in Rotterdam for Walk21 conference this year. We are doing a lot of work at the moment on this subject. Uh, we are running on Monday the 7th of October, we're running a full day workshop around measuring walking and looking at both methodologies and indicators, um, the global north and global south um, dimensions of how we measure and what we measure. We already have released the international data standard, but there's a lot of work to be done to, to look at adopting that. And we are working very closely at the moment with UITP on walking and public transport mobility indicators and also talking with UN Habitat because it's very good, it's all very well to measure the quantity of sidewalks or the connectivity and all those numbers, 
but a critical factor for walking particularly is the quality of that experience and how do we build in measures for quality in addition to the quantity measures. So I'll finish it there. Thank you um, very much for this opportunity and you're very welcome in Rotterdam in October to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Bronwyn, for those comments. Um, very important, I think, that you, first of all, linked walking and cycling as being sort of the, uh, th those, those transport modes that are closest to being human, that get, really get us to, to our roots. Those are really the first, first movements, as you said, and, and then, of course, emphasizing the need to, to really measure accurately and to value properly the contribution of walking and cycling, um, taken together and taking individual individually, as you said, to increase the um, social, social cohesion and to um, create other economic benefits. And so once again, to, to um, sort of emphasize within the, the TCC GSR, and as you noted with that, um, that, that page of blank indicators, or indicators, I should say, without values, we are in the process, of course, of building a, a broader data network, and we're looking for um, again, we're really shining a light on those on those gaps. Um, not not afraid to do that. And so, thanks for um, making that important point. And we look forward to engaging many participants on this call in a broader um, effort to to help to um, expand those data networks where, especially where those gaps exist. So, thank you once again, Bronwyn. Turning to the second of our three policy areas to be featured in the call, I'd like to welcome Sheila Watson. She is Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation, and she will give some background, as noted, on um, the importance of fuel economy and using a, 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 a tried and, and well-tested strategy, but trying to find ways to, to use this more effectively to have a broader reach um, to many parts of the globe. So, Sheila, um, welcome your comments and you have the floor. Hi, Cole. Thank you very much. Um, and hello to everybody on the call. I should start by apologizing for the um, state of my voice. Uh, I just have a rather heavy cold. Uh, hopefully, um, it won't impair you hearing me and understanding me, but I can promise it will mean I'll speak very, very briefly, which is probably no bad thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the work that I want to talk to you about today is, as um, uh, Carl has just described, a project which has hitherto uh, focused or entirely on fuel economy improvements in light duty vehicles. So that's cars and vans. And, and the project is called the Global Fuel Economy Initiative and is a partnership of a range of extremely uh, significant organizations from UN Environment through to the International Transport Forum and International Council on Clean Transportation, International Energy Agency and UC Davis and hosted by ourselves at the FAA Foundation, which is a UK based uh, charity uh, philanthropy, which has uh, itself a focus on safe and sustainable mobility. Hard to say at the best of times. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, I think in the context of what we're discussing here today, what what policy um, scope there is and what developments there have been in the area of fuel economy, there are an awful lot of examples on which one can draw uh, of countries addressing these issues in relation to their vehicle fleets uh, and, and doing it for a variety of reasons, actually. Um, one of the things that we have uh, encountered in the up to 70 countries now, around about 70 countries that we've worked in on these issues, offering capacity building support uh, and working with local uh, organizations um, is that um, that there is, you know, huge potential and a huge range of different things um, which countries are able to do and that there is a, an interest in doing it because there are CO2 gains, yes, but they're very not often not the main thing. There are also big issues around energy security, uh, fuel imports, uh, and so on, which can drive um, concerns to reduce fuel usage. So I'm not going to read the slide out. I'm sure by now everyone looking at it's read it anyway. But it's clear that in some of the biggest markets, um, latterly, uh, there have been significant steps forward uh, from heavy duty, uh, to um, to light duty vehicles, uh, and that's a good thing. Um, so uh, next slide, please. 
um, and the, the sorts of policies that are, that are being considered and the range of policies that we in the Global Fuel Economy Initiative have uh, have worked with countries on you know, are pretty broad. There are lots of different options. Standards are one thing. They're very effective. Uh, I won't go into all of the detail as to why, but they are not least uh, effective because they give uh, manufacturers a clear trajectory, uh, a clear in. in Oh, hello, Sheila. I think we lost you. Like you muted yourself. Hello. Yeah, hello. hello. Oh, you're back. oh, I'm sorry. I don't know when you lost me. Um, oh. So okay, I'll just very very quickly say the last sentence or two again. So really, all I was saying about this slide is that the movement towards improved fuel efficiency isn't a new thing. It's something that has gone on over a period of many years. There have been uh, a whole range of different policy. Um, options brought uh, brought in by different countries. Uh, as I think you may have caught, uh, fuel uh, economy standards are one way of doing things and we think they're very effective, but labeling, consumer information and so on is also very useful. What's worth noting here is way back in the 70s, the US led the way on these things, but it's incredibly important also to know that whilst those standards were coming in, CO2 savings were not following because they the, the improvements in vehicle efficiency were almost entirely converted into improved, as it was seen then, improved vehicle power. Uh, and so ultimately, at the end of the day, the reason that we're focused on improving fuel efficiency is, is to do with CO2, cleaner air and those things. But actually, although this sweep of policies covers a long time period, the objectives of the policy have changed really across that time period. Next slide. Uh, and of course, the main, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> the main issue is really whether or not all of those efforts and all of that um, policy is really moving us forward. Uh, and, and it isn't. Uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, although most of the main markets are covered by some sort of policy, they're not equally um, uh, intensive. They're not equally, you know, they don't all cast forward as far uh, and uh, they're not equally effective. But also very importantly, um, they uh, are not necessarily um, affecting the, the shape um, of the fleet. Um, and so next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and the, the real problem we face is that whilst uh, there is um, a desire perhaps in some countries to reap some benefits from reduced fuel use, consumers are buying bigger and bigger cars uh, and really basically moving into the SUV class. In a, in a really substantial way. Uh, this um, gives you uh, a sense of um, the size and scope of the scale, sorry, of, of vehicle sales in different markets around the world. Uh, and in some, and the obvious examples are China uh, and India, the fleet is growing really very, very quickly indeed. Indonesia is another good example. And the um, fuel efficiency uh, regulations are not keeping pace with not just the growth in the fleet, but also um, in terms of impact, but also the fact that those vehicles are all uh, so much bigger and more um, fuel hungry than, uh, what the, the, than before. So next slide, please. <coughs> and I think, you know, it's also important to reflect uh, on other factors which are impacting um, the uh, the, the pace of change on fuel efficiency, uh, the, 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 the death of diesel, the impact of uh, uh, the Volkswagen scandal on uh, diesel means that diesel sales are falling and they have been in some respects at the forefront of improving fuel efficiency, uh, but also, as I say, the bigger cars are the key things. So this table gives you a sense of the sorts of indicators uh, that are contained within the work uh, to try and get a sense Jayla, we've lost you again for a moment. Sorry, I fear that it's to do with my Wi-Fi not being very good. Uh, I apologize. You're good again, thank you, and please continue. 
Thank you. Uh, so this table gives you an indication of some of the um, uh, indicators that are contained within the work uh, that um, attempt to get at the uh, the, the, the progress uh, globally on fuel economy, drawing from the experience of our working countries and elsewhere. Um, and um, whilst there is a great deal of work going on in terms of benchmarking where countries are at in terms of fuel efficiency, that's something which we're able to find resources uh, to do in country. Progress on actual policy and standards is slow. Uh, most legislative process progress is slow. Um, and so um, this is a very much a long haul game um, and, um, and one uh, alongside much energy efficiency work, which is poorly funded and poorly supported, even though the gains are potentially huge. One area which uh, I think this table sort of reflects, but more generally is the case uh, of increasing interest is the heavy duty uh, sector, which is growing and very soon uh, will be uh, a far more fuel intensive sector than the light duty one. So um, next slide, please. So one of the things that the Global Fuel Economy Initiative um, has concluded looking at the sort of evidence that I've just shared with you and, and much more besides, all of which you can find on our website, uh, which draws on our experience over 10 years now of this work, is that we really do need to sort of go wider and deeper uh, in terms of looking, uh, working with countries on their fleets. At a very practical level, that's how countries see things. They, uh, they see the whole challenge across electrification and across all different subsectors uh, and different fuel types has been something they're wanting increasingly to grapple with collectively and I think we will believe that's a good thing to do. So just last week we relaunched our initiative with a much broader um, uh, remit, a much broader uh, set of targets. We've now set fuel efficiency targets. In fact, we have uh, recommitted to uh, fuel efficiency targets, which we already had for uh, heavy duty and light duty, a 35% reduction by 2035 in fuel use in heavy duty and a halving of average fuel use by 2030 in light duty vehicles. But we've also uh, taken the step of including a whole series of carbon uh, reduction targets, um, which um, take into account um, where we we believe the fleet is going, where we believe policy, global policy is going to get us. Uh, and they're all predicated, of course, on a deep decarbonisation of the grid. Um, I, again, won't go through all of those in, in great detail um, because there's a, a huge amount that lies behind them. But um, you can see them there. You can see that they are extremely ambitious for 2050 um, in terms of... Um, uh, improving uh, all sex subsectors actually of the fleet and they involve uh, a great deal of electrification but of course um, the ultimate the, car, the grid is the key thing which will uh, determine whether or not those CO2 savings are made. This is what we believe is possible um, however um, it's extremely important to say that this is not enough uh, and whilst um, uh, most of those scenarios will get you some great clean air results. They'll only get you the CO2 if the energy is cleaner and they will not do enough to get to the Paris um, below two degree um, scenario. We have to avoid and shift. And uh, it's a very important conclusion of this work. Uh, for too long, we've relied on hoping that technology and within the fleet can get us where we need to be. Uh, it's never been GFEI's contention, but there are those who would say it. Uh, this work proves conclusively that we must have a void shift and all of this deep decarbonisation uh, and efficiency improvements in vehicles. Final slide, please. And so just to say that both of uh, these reports which were released last week are online at the uh, email address at the bottom of that slide. Do take a look. They give you a, a complete overview of how we've um, reached these conclusions. As you could see from the image uh, on my left, um, the uh, partners in this uh, initiative are world leading experts on energy, 
on transport uh, scenarios, on electrification, on electric vehicles, uh, on a whole range of incredibly important aspects of this debate and pulling it all together into this one perspective we think is an incredibly important contribution uh, to uh, the discussion and debate on where next in terms of uh, the fleet uh, and, uh, and CO2. Um, and I would say as well, that in the coming weeks and months we'll be laying out in far greater detail how we plan as a partnership to support countries in this wider uh, prospectus. Um, so uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Sheila, thank you very much for your comments and um, in, in particular <coughs> for, for raising a couple of challenges. Um, certainly spelling out that legislative process is, uh, is slow, but that uh, it can also, also sort of be at odds with consumer choices. So. Um, I think it, it it brings sort of new meaning and urgency to the um, the this sort of bottom up and 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 top down struggle in in moving fuel efficiency forward. And very exciting to hear about the the relaunch of the of the GFEI program and um, bringing it to a broader set of vehicle types. This is very exciting. And and finally, I would just say uh, I think it's very informative to have you bring together these many uh, these many pieces. Um, bringing together the need for um, fuel economy, electrification, and um, and also avoiding shift and improve, avoiding shifting and improving in order to meet those 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 Paris Agreement targets. So thank you for um, for for merging those those various aspects um, and various approaches. And and I think it's a very fitting segue to our our final panelist in linking uh, in making that important link between efficiency and and renewables in the transport sector um so once again i'd like to introduce hannah murdoch she is project manager and analyst of the ren 21 secretariat welcome you hannah to to give comments on um as, as i mentioned earlier the the very critical role of renewables in in getting us toward a zero emissions transport sector and i would invite you to to take some um I, I realize we're running up against our 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 um scheduled time but hannah would love for you to take a bit of extra time and hoping that most of the participants can continue and then we'll we'll also have a very short question and answer session following your comments hannah so hannah the floor is yours thank you kyle and thanks to slowcat for the invitation um, as mentioned, I'm Hannah Murdoch. I'm coordinating the Renewable Global Status Report at REN21, which is the Renewable Energy Policy Network of the 21st century. REN21 brings together a range of diverse actors supporting the uptake of renewables from governments and intergovernmental organizations to NGOs, industry associations, and science and academia. I'll be discussing the findings presented in the Renewable Energy section of the TCC GSR that REN21 was Rent 21 was happy to contribute to, but also complementing that information with some updates that we've been working on at Rent 21 for our upcoming Renewables Global Status Report, our GSR, to which SLOCAT has also contributed and that we've been publishing annually since 2005. The next slide, please. As you can see here, almost all of global transport energy needs are still met by oil and petroleum products with biofuels making up the majority of the still very small renewable energy share at just 3%. And while the fleet of electric vehicles is increasing globally, the share of electricity in the sector remains small, around 1%, with only a quarter of that electricity coming from renewables. And even though there have been gains in energy efficiency, particularly in road transport, Global energy demand in the transport sector has increased at least 45% since the year 2000, due mainly to the growing number and size of light duty vehicles and rising demand for air travel and freight transport. So the result has been a global increase in CO2 emissions from the transport sector, even as emissions for the sector in some regions have fallen but the sector as a whole accounted for nearly a quarter of global energy related CO2 emissions in 2016. And while increasing electrification of transport offers an opportunity to dramatically reduce the sector related CO2 emissions, particularly in countries that are reaching high shares of renewables in their electricity mix, there are other 
main entry points for renewables in the transport sector, such as the use of uh, biofuel blends, as, as shown here, and natural gas vehicles and infrastructure converted to run on upgraded biomethane. And the electrification of the different transport modes uh, also includes the use of battery, battery electric, and plug-in hybrid vehicles, and also the hydrogen, synthetic fuels, and electric fuels, as long as that electricity is itself renewable. Next slide, please. As you can see here, biofuels have seen very strong growth since 2004, although they were starting from a small base. And more recently, demand for biofuels increased around 18% between 2013 and 2017, and has seen moderate growth since 2017. Biofuels continue to be a key element of renewable energy in transport in key subsectors. For example, aviation, shipping, and long-distance trucking are expected to remain reliant on liquid fuels in the short to medium term, but there remains a need to scale up the production of advanced biofuels in particular, and the need to phase in complementary technologies plus energy efficiency to reduce the need for biofuel production. Increased fuel economy standards, as just mentioned by Sheila, are a demonstrated approach as it's easier to save a unit of energy than produce. However, as we've seen, fuel economy standards for light duty vehicles are only present in about 20% of countries and even fewer countries have them for heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. So while there have been some advances in the policy landscape for renewables and transport, such as the examples shown here, policy support for the sector continues to lag behind the support for renewables in the power sector. And this is despite the higher contribution to total final energy consumption of the transport sector. And if you look at the next slide, you can see that Next slide, please. thank you. Uh, you can see that uh, that biofuels and biofuel blend mandates remain um, remain crucial. And as biofuels are the largest contributor to the renewable share in the sector, they are still a central component of national renewable transport policy frameworks. By the end of 2018, biofuel blend mandates existed at the national and or subnational level in at least 70 countries, but this is only about a third of countries globally. No additional countries have adopted biofuel blend mandates in the past year, but some countries that had mandates in place added new ones and several existing mandates were strengthened. However, few new measures promoting advanced biofuels or other fuel sources were adopted in 2018. The EU provisionally agreed on an advanced biofuels and biogas mandate of 1% by 2025 and 3.5% by 2030. And uh, other national governments supporting advanced biofuels include Croatia, Denmark, Italy, and the United States, which announced in 2018 that there would be an increase in its biofuels, uh, advanced biofuels mandates starting in 2019. Next slide, please. Electric vehicles can play an important role in increasing the use of renewables in the transport sector and in reducing global carbon emissions. And this is particularly when they're powered with rising shares of renewable electricity. And although numerous measures have been adopted in recent years to scale up electric vehicle use, there have still been few efforts that make the link to renewable electricity production or to ensure that electric vehicles support the integration of renewable energy into energy supplies. At the national level, only Austria had a policy directly linking renewables with EVs as of the end of 2018. But nevertheless, EVs are becoming an important component of national energy development strategies in the sector. And similarly, some initiatives are emerging for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, but the vast majority of hydrogen continues to be 
produced using non-renewable non sources. And shown in this map is the overlap of those countries that have both electric vehicle targets and renewable electricity targets. Even though they are not directly linked, there is some overlap at least. Next slide, please. So looking at the policy indicators for 2018, biofuel mandates are still only in 70 countries. As I mentioned, no new countries added biofuel burn mandates. Advanced biofuel mandates can be found in four countries. Renewable energy transport targets are now in 45 countries. However, there is still only one country with a target for 100% renewable energy and transport. Since Denmark remains the only country in the world with a target for 100% renewables in final energy. And as just mentioned, now Austria is the only country with an electric vehicle policy that, can, that is combined with renewable electricity. Still, there's some overlap, as I mentioned, and now 49 countries have targets for both electric vehicles and renewable electricity targets, even if they are not directly linked. Next slide, please. Now moving on to the market indicators. I've already mentioned many of these and I'm not going to go through all of them now, but I'll mention that the key indicator table stretches over these two pages for renewables and transport, mainly because REN21 has been tracking this development of renewables in the sector since 2004. And uh, along with the other updated figures mentioned, uh, during this presentation, the latest data will be available in the next uh, Renewables Global Status Report that will be released in less than a month. The main takeaway, however, continues to be that renewable energy uptake in transport, um, among other sectors, is still far too slow to meet international climate and development goals. Next slide. You can find details of uh, renewables in the transport sector in the upcoming Renewables Global Status Report that will be launched on 18th of June. But also in all of REN21's reports, transport is highlighted in every single chapter from policies, markets, and industry to efficiency and electric vehicles. And in addition to the flagship GSR, uh, REN21 is launching the first Renewables in Cities report They'll have a lot more information on transport. And the Asia and Pacific report that's due out later this year. These reports also represent an opportunity to get involved, either as a data contributor for a specific country, region, or topic to help better inform the, the data in the transport sector where you're located, uh, or also participating as an expert peer reviewer. We're continuously trying to build up the reporting on transport, so I encourage you to visit the pages for each of these reports to read more and find out how to participate. Each of these is hyperlinked here. And finally, mark your calendars for the next International Renewable Energy Conference to be held in October in Seoul, South Korea. As with all the 21 events, there will be several sessions focusing on the transport sector. So with that, thanks to everyone for your attention and back to you, Carl. Hannah, thank you so very much for your comments and thanks in particular for making the time today, seeing that you've got a very tight deadline just a few weeks out in um, launching REN21's next uh, global status report. But um, I, I, I should, should note that uh, REN21 has been a very important special advisor throughout the process of creating the TCC GSR. Um, we've certainly emulated uh, to a great extent the experience that uh, REN21 has shown. So thank you for that guidance as well as your contribution today. And um, yes, in uh, within your comments, what really stood out to me is this idea that um, there's, a, there's a lot of potential, there's some critical mass, there's some nice numbers that we see, but as you note that the um, that forward progress is 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 halting in some respects, uh, especially in the transport sector as regards to renewables, and that we're not yet on track to meet the goals. And um, helpful to see, though, the very cross-cutting research that you're doing, um, especially bringing renewables to cities, um, 
highlighting the, the, the role of transport within these, these various reports. And so, um, as, as noted before, primary goal in this report is, is to really um, cut across the sectors and to um, make sure that, that, our, that our efforts are, are, are very concerted and not um, siloed in, in any sense. So thank you very much for, for those comments. Um, what I would love to do is to ask, um, as, as we've again gone just a bit over time, I'd like to keep this, this fairly brief, but I'd like to ask a general question to each of our panelists and also to note that um, Bronwyn is, um, has, has stepped away um, to, to another um, commitment. And so what I would like to do is, is ask a general question to the, the three panelists who are on the line and kind of connecting some of these presentations, sort of seeing how do we, um, how do we help to bridge the gap between our, our current ambition, our current action and implementation toward those, those very important targets. And so I would put perhaps to Megumi, but to all the, the panelists, um, sort of what, what is the, what is the, how can the UNFCCC do, do more, or both from a top down and a very bottom up standpoint. So I'd like the perspectives of each of the panelists how can we ratchet ratchet up ambition over over time, considering that the Paris Agreement is a very bottom up process, as you'd mentioned? You know, what are the the points of leverage that we have, both from um, from within national governments, also in a broader sense from the UNFCCC and and from the the global community, but also in terms of um, city city action and, and individual choice? Kind of how can we again give those governments confidence to ratchet up ambition? Um, and connected to that, when we look to the fuel economy, um, global fuel economy initiative, as noted, about 20% of countries are currently engaged. Sort of, again, what does it take to really, really bump that up? And can the UNFCCC, can the regional climate weeks and the, and the Marrakesh partnership on global climate action help to move that forward? What is, what is the role between these? And then, you know, looking, Hannah, as you mentioned, specific country examples, for instance, the um, policy that Austria has to link renewables and, and electric vehicles. Um, we see again the potential to strengthen these linkages, but um, we're still not quite moving as quickly as we need to as you We do to use those very important peer examples and bring those to other peers across the world. So I would um, maybe invite Megumi to comment first, then Sheila and, and Hannah in turn on that kind of three-part question. Thank you, Carl. Um, yes, I would like to highlight some of the, the strengths that you already have. You have a very vast um, network partnership of different um, experts uh, in your sector, and through um, expansion of such collaboration, horizontal collaboration, um, you are able to tap into other uh, wealth of resources in terms of knowledge of um, country needs assessment. Um, so as in any good conversation and mutual understanding, I think we need to tailor our communication to the needs of the recipients, meaning um, instead of advertising and announcing all the time what we are doing, we need to understand first what national governments or policymakers, specifically the drafters of the NDCs, are struggling and so that we can identify the gaps that stakeholders can fill um, and and you don't need to kind of reinvent the whole wheel um, you already have the um, solutions we just need to somehow tailor to, to particular um, national circumstances or regional context and in UNFCCC sessions we tend to look at um, the common um, lowest common denominator of problems or barriers or opportunities also in positive um, aspects, but that means it's not necessarily applicable to a particular country, a particular city. Um, so in this sense, um, I think it is good to first have a news assessment, and there are many uh, intelligence and uh, research work done, um, studying the NDC submitted currently or um, through the research individual interviews and uh, research per country and perhaps with your collective wisdom um, we can target and tailor your support to the um, respective countries or regions 
And Regional Climate Weeks will be a very good um, forum um, because policymakers are not just from the country, uh, Ministry of Environment, but different ministries, including transport. And by proposing such um, tailored, in-depth discussion, we can attract more uh, key policymakers or key drafters um, in, in this uh, area. So that's one. And another thing is also to show the, the future, the roadmap of what countries need to do or by 2020, by 2030, by 2050, where we want to be. We show the, the vision and it was also presented um, by some of our speakers today and we could perhaps um, detail what concrete actions by concrete um, actors should be taken by the time-bound um, approach. And so this kind of, uh, we already have in Marrakesh partnership, we have what's called action tracker, but we it's basically meant to show the way forward um, so that policymakers who are um, in the position to contribute to the NDCs could look at, okay, that this is where we want to wanna be, and these are the actions we have to take, and these are the initiatives that are being at the table offered, um, already low-hanging fruits are there. And so we can maybe have this kind of um, two-way uh, approach, um, but first, I think what's important is the understanding of the concrete needs and assessment um, of individual countries and, and this is. And Marrakesh Partnership tries to um, create such partnership across seven different uh, thematic areas, including transport. Um, so the horizontal partnership and uh, collaboration can be already achieved there. And we are also bringing in parties and policymakers uh, at the table uh, in various occasions. Thank you so much, Megumi. Really helpful to get a sense of, uh, for, well, for in particular, the action tracker, as you as you note, within the the Marrakesh Partnership on Global Climate Action, and um, yeah, certainly I think very importantly the, the need to tailor communications to the needs of the participants. I think it's an important uh, lesson that we need to kind of continue to to reinforce in 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 our broader efforts to make sure that we're we're really helping to translate information into commitments and action. And I think um, with that, Sheila. Do you see a role for, um, in particular, maybe perhaps can you say a bit more about the role of, of the Marrakesh Partnership in helping to advance the, the efforts of fuel efficiency um, and, and also the regional climate weeks, perhaps to move, as you mentioned, some of the larger markets are very much engaged, China, India, et cetera, in, um, in fuel economy efforts, but how to move to some of the, I would say, um, regional regional peers or regional um you know countries in those various regions based on the on the regional climate weeks and let me add sort of one additional question here um as as you know it's been noted by some participants that the 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 second um version or the relaunch of the gfei the global fuel economy initiative focuses on um it's it's, it's noted that it, it targets co2 reductions but not specifically Energy efficiency reduction. So perhaps you can you can discuss um, that also in the context of the um, of of the the UNFCCC and the and the, and the Marrakesh partnership. Yes. Okay, Carl. Thank you very much. So that's there's so much that could be said um, in response to that question. I, I think just keeping it as simple as I can and reflecting very much out of ten years of experience, which is really quite you know it's kind of almost unheard of. There are only very few programs in the transport sector which have been funded by a philanthropy uh, for, for uh, by anyone for 10 years uh, to do uh, some work. And so I'm reflecting on what I've learned there. And I think the first thing I would say is that it doesn't matter which process you engage with. There is a sort of obsessive interest in those processes in always, you know, focusing on something glittery. Uh, and it's terribly important that, you know, the person who speaks is incredibly high level or is almost certainly got to be from the private sector. And and there was an approach sometimes, I think, which is which is really quite abstracted from the reality of countries genuinely struggling to understand how to address issues, because the people who are struggling are very ordinary people, just like you and I, policy people, 
uh, working in departments with all of the disconnects and all of the uh, lack of information that we all know, you know, on a day to day basis we experience in our own work. Uh, and so these very high level um, kind of um, glittery events can sometimes really just be very abstracted from the reality of the day to day. So I would always encourage you and FCCC to, you know, not forget the slightly less sexy elements and energy efficiency is forgotten every single time, even though I think every speaker here said pretty much it's just the best energy saving CO2 that you can do. And in transport, it's huge. So I think I'd say that first. And I think maybe therefore the regional meetings will be great places for um, initiatives that really are working with countries and offering capacity building uh, support and sharing good practice and bringing countries together and officials together to, to talk and really work through the, the right down in the weeds, you know, the detail as stuff that they have to put in front of ministers, not the grand words. Um, if you could do more bringing those sorts of people together and supporting initiatives that do that, I think that's absolutely crucial. Um, and that's how we will change the world in those sorts of steps. Uh, so that will be my first reflection. Um, secondly, in terms just to answer your point of, of GFEI, what we've done is we have broadened out from light duty vehicles. We now are acknowledging the massive contribution heavy duty is making uh, two and three wheelers in particular in relation to air quality in many cities. And then, of course, um, looking uh, at buses, too, because they are a growing, um, a growing part of the fleet and they're very much challenged by issues around electrification. Built into the work that lies in the paper behind our projections is a, is a strong analysis of market factors around electrification, policies around all of these issues, uh, taking a full global look at that. It's a very substantive piece of work. And then, as I said before, weighing that next to um, what is reasonable to expect, again, based on uh, IEA and, and other expert perspectives in terms of decarbonizing um, the grid. So we haven't lost the efficiency piece, that's still in there. We're still talking about the need for improved efficiency in existing technology. We see electrification as an efficiency improvement in itself, because electric vehicles are inherently more efficient, as well as being an alternate fuel. Um, uh, I'm representing this extremely simplistically, just for the ease of time and, and so on. Um, uh, and, and, the, and then, yeah, and, and then putting that all within this context of what we could achieve. But I, I really do think it's terribly important to emphasize two things. One is a links across sector. We've got to get our heads around, you know, this whole idea that there are transport problems and there are energy problems. Um, we've spent many years working with RIN21, for example, but, and, and others within the Sustainable Energy for All initiative as a transport initiative to try and join up. Uh, our initiative joins up energy and transport. And I just, again, would say back to you and FCCC, can we do some more of that as well? Bring sectors together. It's not good enough anymore to, to say that's an energy problem. We've got to support each other uh, in that regard. Um, but yes, uh, and then going back to the targets for, for GFEI, saying emphatically that the best you can hope for with these efficiency measures in place uh, and so on is, is a contribution to where we need to be. It isn't everything and avoid and shift is crucial. So really just being clear about that. And I think, again, the more that organisations like Slowcat can continue to play the absolutely essential role you play in bringing the elements of the transport discussion together increasingly with other interests, then um, the more that we can collectively, uh, I think, develop more sophisticated approaches. So hopefully, sorry, not too many words, but just my thoughts. Okay, thank you so so very much, Sheila, and 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 very useful thoughts. Um, I think I wanted to pick up on that uh, initial comment of um, of focusing on something glittery, as you say, and I think it's also a good segue to um, right. So that energy efficiency gets a little bit lost in the background. I think um, perhaps it's fair to say that electrification, electrical electric vehicles are getting quite a lot of attention. And so turning to to Hannah, I think um, a, a bit of, a bit of a two-part question again now, building on some of the previous comments. But 
I think we can we can first look at the um, contribution of, of biofuels relative to electrification. I know you've touched on that in your presentation, um, but 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 yes, just sort of noting noting the fact that electrification takes um, some some time and cost. Um, that also um, some participants are noting that the biofuels are not fully renewable, and um, certainly there are land use implications for a broader um, adoption of biofuels. Um, certainly, some comment that um, bio waste fuel may be considered renewable. So perhaps you could comment briefly on the on renewability of biofuels. Um, also, also noted that um, from another participant that that um, Indonesia has has a biofuel mandate in place and so that's um also a, a point for further discussion but i guess what i'd like to know is really what is the relative potential of biofuels um, and electrification and maybe you can say just a bit more about austria's policy on linking renewables and electric vehicles vehicle electrification and how this might be extended to other countries Okay, so I should cover all that in uh, the remaining three minutes we've got. Forgive me. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, well, basically, I guess uh, to start with the the biofuels point, um, they, as as you saw in the the first slide, they make up three percent of the of the share of uh, fuels in the entire transport sector, which is quite small and has not been growing very much over the past years. So um, there's still a lot of potential for uh, biofuels to, to help decarbonize the sector. Of course, they need to be produced sustainably. And I understand that there are concerns of, of sustainability and how they're being produced in many places. Uh, but this is also part of why these governments that have started to implement advanced biofuel blending mandates is already a positive sign. There are still only four of these countries um, that, that are implementing the, the biofuel blending mandates along with the EU, but it's a start at least, uh, although clearly there's still a long way to go. The, the main missing link is ambitious targets and comprehensive policy support for the transport sector and um, across other sectors as well. But um, the success of renewables in the power sector has shown that the energy transition is possible. And so some lessons can be drawn from that success, but policymakers should also look to successful examples in other jurisdictions and how they can be tailored to their local situations. You mentioned Austria, which uh, their policy offers a purchase price premium for electric vehicles charged with 100% renewable electricity. So this provides an incentive to residents to simulate uptake of both renewables and EVs at the same time. Um, and there are more examples of direct linking at the local level. So you should, uh, uh, listeners should definitely report that we'll be producing later this year to find a lot more details on that. Um, but basically, as the other panelists have mentioned, I would echo that more coordination is needed across the sectors, across different ministries, across different levels of government to put in place these integrated policies. And um, I mean, Austria is just one good example of how a, a policy that's linking um, the sectors could be implemented. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for spelling that out. Um, very, very concisely. Again, uh, there's there's a lot to cover here, as we know, and that's um, again the goal of the of the GSR, and really um, looking out toward the the next edition, the next full edition. We should I should say, as we're still in the process of um, applying the um, some of the conclusions and findings of the initial TCC GSR to the regional climate weeks, as as discussed by Megumi and others on this call. Um, so we are we are full on in that effort for this for this year. We're also in the process of building up a network of national focal points to help provide more data, more information, more policy examples, and um, not only national, I should say, but also subnational focal points as we aim for our next full edition at the end of next year in late 2020. So once again, we welcome 
participation from from those on this call and beyond this call to to help us increase the the data that we have to to help us track those indicators and to get more more measurable and more comparable data um, across these various policy areas. So we really welcome your participation. Appreciate you contacting the team um, with this information to contribute. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your uh, your attention, your participation in this call. Um, we and also thank you for for taking some some extra time as we had a very rich. Um, set of, um, of or a very rich group, I should say, of panelists and a lot of information to cover today. Thank you for um, spending some extra time with us. We will certainly keep you posted with forthcoming webinars and other opportunities for engagement. And um, yes, we, we, we uh, appreciate your time, once again, your attention. Um, you can follow us here um, with, with the various, through the various information streams mentioned on this final slide. And um, so thanks very much again for your attention, for your participation, for your interest, and we look forward to reconnecting with each of you soon. Thank you. Thank you.